This is your friendly neighborhood author, Jonathan, and you are listening to Season 4 of the Floor Rejects Podcast, The Wells House Phenomenon. Okay, I think we're uh, I think we're recording from what I can tell. This handy little remote makes things a lot easier. Sorry. Um, hi, welcome back to the Floor Rejects podcast. This is your friendly neighborhood author, serial uh, Taco Bell orderer, um, serial Taco Bell order regretter, Jonathan, and you have stumbled onto chapter seven of uh, season four of the Floor Rejects podcast. Quick recap, last week, uh, Warren came out to Lila rather unceremoniously. In fact, I think he was just pretty much tired of her coming to visit him in the middle of the night and putting up with this whole back and forth of, should I stay and visit you? Should I stay and keep you company? And he was over it. Lila caught on pretty quick once he spelled it out, even though he probably shouldn't have had to spell it out as much as he did. Um... And then we get the switch, the switch we've been waiting for for six chapters now. Thomas is sent into the room in the middle of the night for a midnight visit. Um, And that's kind of the end. That's what we're left with is the shocker of Thomas walking. So uh, before I burp up any more Taco Bell, because I did eat it again today, because I have no self-control, let's go ahead and get into this. I apologize if you can hear the sound of 17 washer and dryers going on in my basement for this episode. Um, everybody is, I guess, trying to do laundry before Christmas. Um, and that means that it just echoes all around my home. So we'll do our best. I did notice for those of you who watch the visual version of this, that the, um, camera, I switched to the front, front, no, the rear-facing camera on my phone, um, which is a lot higher quality. Problem is, is that it also has focus problems when it's, like, this far away from me, and, uh, you know, the light is not ideal, which it's not when I turn the room red. So, let's just get used to it. Let's see if I fixed it this week. Who knows if I did? I, I don't. I certainly do not. We'll figure it out. Either way, things are gonna be kind of creaky and loud this episode, but, um, Alexa, turn the office red. I say let's get into it. Chapter 7. Let's let's do this and, and get it over with. Anything else you'd like to say, Miss Alexa? Okay, good. All right, Chapter 7, coming right up. Chapter 7, switch up. Warren's shrill voice cuts through the room, and Thomas looks up at him, a bit confused at his tone, unaware the man in bed was now fully informed on what was going on around him each night. Thomas assumed that Warren's adventures within the realms of his dreams were just strange flukes they hadn't encountered before, and didn't tell his mother simply because he didn't want to deal with the theatrics of figuring out how Warren was able to control himself. He had to admit that part of the withholding was also because Warren was, so far, his favorite Wells man to come to the manor, and Thomas had seen many Wells men. I was just, uh, do you want some company, Master Wells? Thomas repeats. He was new to this. Never in the history of the manor had he ever been sent to the suite for midnight visits. There had been one other Wells, Warren's great uncle, that Lila had suspected would enjoy the company of the less refined sex, but she had gathered this information during an encounter that had gone much better than her attempts with this latest incarnation had. Warren sat stunned in the bed, clutching at the blankets around him. Thomas cannot figure out why he is so nervous. He steps further into the room, unsure how to proceed. Warren rolls farther back on the bed on his haunches, almost as if to launch up and strike at Thomas. No, uh, no, Thomas, I, I, uh, I don't really feel like staying up late tonight. Warren's voice is shaking. Now Thomas feels bad, insofar as he could, knowing what the end game here was. The poor young man looked mortified. He takes another step towards Warren's bed, now an arm length away. Don't be nervous, Warren. It's just me. 
I just wanted to, um, well, check on you. See if you needed anything, Thomas says, as Warren's eyes grow wider the closer they get to each other. Warren's nervousness was not for the reasons that Thomas assumed. Warren, always quick on the draw, knew something was wrong. It was one thing for Lila to offer up her company, as it had been her modus operandi from the jump, but now, for this once scrawny, now brawny man to present himself up made Warren supremely uncomfortable. While he was so touch-deprived that he had recently found himself eyeing up a particularly muscular statue in the Versailles Garden that afternoon, he got the feeling that Thomas was some sort of sacrificial lamb that Lila was offering up, and that didn't sit right with him. He was still unclear as to how exactly his consciousness was being split up and why, but even if he found that Thomas was much more appealing, while not nearly old or gruff enough to be perfect, Warren was not going to allow the man into his bed. He didn't want to screw up this indefinite working relationship, and he didn't want to give Lila what it was she wanted from him, as tempting as Thomas was. I'm not nervous, just surprised. I don't like to be caught with, well, with my pants down, or off, Warren explains. Thomas smiles genuinely, but wipes it off his face instantly. He wasn't here to make small talk with a friend. Sorry, Warren, Master Wells. I'll knock next time he says, and Warren nods appreciatively. Thank you. Good night, Thomas, Warren says as Thomas shuts the door behind him. Thomas sagged against the door as it shut. His mother would be furious, but he couldn't force Warren into anything. That wasn't in his nature, and it wasn't supposed to be in his mother's either. He shuffled down the hall and up the stairs to his room, content to wallow in self-pity until daylight. Warren, sufficiently freaked out, tries to climb from the bed as quietly as he can, locking the door to gather his thoughts in peace. He goes again to the bathroom to feel as safe as possible in this house. He stared at himself in the mirror, trying as hard as he could to think of a way out of this. As he traces a finger over his reflection, he noticed that he leaves a smudge on the glass. He instinctively moves to wipe it away, but then the idea hits him. He was so busy trying to push his way out of the house that he never thought to be a bit more subtle. He runs back into the bedroom, looking through the empty drawers of the dresser and bedside tables, looking for anything, a scrap of paper, a notebook, something. He finds nothing. He thinks about writing a note on his phone's reminders, but when he touches it, it won't light up. It's almost as if the world around him didn't want him to leave a note. He runs to the kitchen, rifling through drawers, looking on tables and cabinets, but no paper. No way to leave a note. He kicks himself for being so simple, not thinking before to leave a note. He looks out a window just before he rushes up the stairs to the fourth floor studio. He can see the walls of blackness rolling around towards the house, towards him. He sprints, taking the stairs three at a time, and crashes into the vaulted room as the windows darken. He can't see much, and he rifles blindly as he hears the glass panes rattle. He stops, sighing heavily. Next time he says glumly, twirling his finger in the blackness as the world completely dissolves. He wakes up with a pounding headache and a craving for bacon, which he can faintly smell. He smiles, pulling a robe on and rushing to get first dibs, which he got at every meal. As he ate, he watched Lila slowly shuffle around the room, her age showing as she gasped in pain while reaching up into a cabinet for something. Warren rushes over to her, grabbing the pan she was reaching for. She smiles, patting his hand. Such a sweet boy. So very sweet, she says, turning and slowly making her way back across the room to finish breakfast. She plates it for Warren, who dives in hungrily, every bite of his first and second plate gone as Thomas walks in, wiping sweat from his brow, his white t-shirt already gray around the armpits, the crevice of his chest and his back. Warren forces himself to keep chewing. Thomas moves past him, the musty smell of sweat and deodorant giving way to an involuntary rush of blood to Warren's groin. He scoots farther under the table, turning to the window to hide his blush. Thomas sits in front of him after a moment, giving Warren a small but kind smile. Warren found Thomas interesting. In almost two months, the only time the man had won anything other than to give him one-word answers and a look of general indifference was when he was outside, or when Lila just wasn't around. When they had washed the truck, when they had dug up that pipe, and when they were watching TV alone at night, otherwise, it was like he was too scared to speak. Warren worried that he was to blame. When he was a kid, really until he left Paisley, his mother and father had harped on him for being an acquired taste. And as much as he had tried to tone it down in the house, he was worried he hadn't done enough. He looks up to Thomas, trying to smile genuinely. What are your plans today, Thomas? 
Warren asked. Thomas looks up like he's surprised to be spoken to. Oh, uh, well, there's a broken section of fencing down in the back of the property. I'm thinking I'm going to get that fixed today, and then, well, I don't know that... I guess the house needs a little weatherproofing on the roof, so I might do that as well, Thomas says, his mother nodding from her spot at the island to Warren's right. Well, I I could help you with that if, if you want it. I mean, I've been meaning to go into town, maybe get a haircut, go shopping, but I could help you, Warren offers, but Thomas shakes his head meekly. You go on your trip to town. I'll be fine, Thomas says, and Lila clicks her tongue, leaning up. Thomas is so modest. I'm sure he could use the help. Couldn't you, my my son? Her tone is pointed, and Thomas begins to stutter excuses at Warren, but Warren holds his hand up. I'll go to town for a haircut, and then I'll come back and give you a hand with what's left. Good compromise? Warren asks. The duo nod, shooting each other weirdly angry looks. Now, can I pick anything up from the hardware store? The grocery? He asks. Lila scurries to a pad of paper next to the fridge, ripping off the top sheet and handing it to Warren. Thomas looks up, squinting out the window as he tries to think. The only thing I can think of is some nails for the weather stripping and fence rail, Thomas says. With a newfound purpose, Warren jumps up from the table, going to get dressed and out the door, excited to have a reason to drive his Jeep, which had sat practically unused since he'd gotten it. In town, he goes to the one and only barber shop he finds online and takes a number from the old-timey dispenser out front. When he hears his number, he looks up, making eye contact with an older gentleman who beckons him over. The man is probably in his mid to late forties, his hair perfectly coiffed and full, the salt and pepper color continuing into a well-maintained beard cut sharply at the neck. His thick, strong arms drape worn with a cape. Haven't seen you around. What's your name? What can I do you for? the man asks. Warren introduces himself and explains what he wants, mostly just to get the front of his hair trimmed up so it doesn't poke his eyes and the sides and back shaped up. He finds out that the man's name is Larry, and the man loops around him and they strike up a rapport. Larry's tone and the lilt in his voice gives away his proclivities before he does. In fact, he never says it outright, but when Warren casually opens up the dating app on his phone, he can see Larry glance at the screen in its reflection. So... What do you do, Warren? He asks as he shampoos the younger man's hair. Warren ponders how honest to be, and after a moment, he answers with a simple, I'm a caretaker, which wasn't exactly untrue, however ambitious it might have been to say. Larry nods, leaning his client up with a towel draped over his head. Back in the chair, Larry is a bit more flirtatious, bumping his legs into Warren's knees as he circles with a blow dryer, then straddling one of Warren's legs as he makes adjustments to the styling, all while keeping up a steady stream of mildly suggestive questions. Warren eventually drops the facade, making mention of some ex-boyfriend to make it clear that he was picking up on Larry's hints. Larry makes a pleasantly surprised face, his green eyes sparkling, the crow's feet around them making him look all the more cheerful. So... Do you come to Elkins often? I'd love to be your your regular stylist, Larry says as Warren doles out cash with a generous tip. Yeah, my place is way out on Adams Street. I'll call the shop next time and I need a cut and schedule an appointment for you, Warren says. Larry grips his upper arm as he turns to leave. You can just text me. I'll make sure to leave a slot open for you, the man says, taking Warren's phone and calling his own number. Warren smiles as he leaves the shop, and before he can get out of the parking lot, he's gotten a nice to meet you from Larry, whose profile picture populates as he programs the number into his phone. Warren texts the man casually as he stops at the hardware store and the small food mart on his way back to the manor, and by the time he pulls into the gates and his phone starts its glitches before reconnecting to the Wi-Fi, he's had a pretty good exchange going. They flirt innocently enough until Warren sends something risque, a flirtatious question that warrants a racy response. Warren smiles, pocketing his phone for a moment to carry the groceries into the house and then grab the box of nails he had for Thomas. He didn't see him or a ladder anywhere near the roof, so he ran up the stairs to the studio and ignores the wave of deja vu he felt as he entered the room and peered out the window. He couldn't spot Thomas at first, as the back edge of the property wasn't exactly visible, but eventually he saw movement through a thicket of dense trees. 
He ran back down and hopped into his Jeep, gleefully turning the car over and switching to four-wheel drive before rocketing out onto the gravel road, swerving around the barn and into the trees like he was in a car commercial. He drives towards where he last saw Thomas, the trees providing some relief in the scorching sun. As he pulls up, next to Thomas's work area, he laughs as the man looks up and jumps, surprised to see a full-sized SUV parked ten feet away. Wow, I, I must have been really focused. I didn't even hear you pull up, he says, drawing his arm across his forehead, squinting up at the sun. Well, I didn't want to walk all the way out here. I figured this thing could handle it, Warren says, patting the hood of his car proudly and hopping down, tossing a bottle of Coke to Thomas, who cheers to him silently and chugs the drink. Christ, that's good. Has it always been this good? Thomas laughs, looking at the bottle incredulously. Warren laughs and confirms, before asking Thomas how much he had left to do on the fence. Not much. I was going to secure this last rail and then maybe take a dip in the swimming hole before I tackled the roof. Give the sun a chance to cool down a bit, he says, and Warren's ears perk. Swimming hole? He asks. And Thomas nods, quickly driving a few nails into the fence rail, and then gesturing for Warren to follow him deeper into the thicket. They walk for a few minutes, Warren marveling at the old growth stretching up to meet the sky all around him, and Thomas crashing through the underbrush determinedly. Soon, they reach a depression, and Warren can see that it's a steep drop-off, almost basically a huge hole in the ground surrounded by cliffs. He turns to Thomas, who smiles devilishly. That's a... It's not something you can see from the house, Warren says. The water is unnaturally blue, almost electric, and completely still, with old logs jutting up from the water's floor and smooth tan rocks sticking out from around the edges. No, it is not. It's a natural spring, and it comes from an old sinkhole. This is some of the cleanest water you can find, Thomas says, and Warren looks at him suspiciously. It's where? Thomas says, and before Warren can respond, the man has whipped off his shirt and is working on unbuckling his belt. Warren, shocked and uncomfortable, turns away, laughing nervously. What? I'm not shy, Warren. We, we both have the same equipment, Thomas says, and Warren giggles despite his discomfort. It's not that, Thomas. I just, I, well, I don't think we should cross that line. Seems like a bad idea since we all live here together. Warren says, his hand now shielding his line of sight from Thomas. Cross what line, Warren? I just see one guy trying to have a good time and another guy who's going to let the possibility of liking what he sees get in the way of a fantastic opportunity, Thomas says, and Warren scoffs. He'd spent the last two months tiptoeing around these people, as much as he could remember the last two months, and he thought Thomas was on the right track. Warren slowly drops his hand, and Thomas smiles as Warren looks up at him. Thomas stands, hands on hips, in a pair of skin-tight white briefs. His chest is puffed out, and his narrow waist is complemented by a set of rounded, muscular thighs that flex as he shifts from foot to foot. See? Not so scary, is it? Thomas asks, and Warren gives a half-hearted, still uneasy laugh. Thomas rolls his eyes and turns to the edge. Well, I'm jumping. I'll wait for you to change from down there. Thomas tells Warren as he bends over, a thumb in each side of his underwear, and strips down completely before launching himself over the edge with a whoop. Warren shuts his eyes, feeling oddly off-kilter in this place, glad he didn't see much as Thomas was falling. Warren had never been particularly flirty, but he was never this awkward, never this uncomfortable. Thomas had done everything but bend over and grab his ankles, and yet Warren had this nagging voice at the back of his mind, a voice that told him not to follow his usual instincts. He hears his phone trilling in his pockets, and unlocks it to see that Larry has sent some particularly risque remarks, and Warren smiles to himself, content to be this close to intimacy, through a screen, and no closer. Come on, water! Well, it's, it's refreshing, Thomas calls from the pit below. Warren peeks over the edge, unsure whether he wanted to take that plunge. It's fine, worry wart. Just jump from the same spot I did. I've done it a thousand times. Thomas is egging Warren on, and Warren decides to live a little, just a little, and pulls his shirt over his head and reluctantly shimmies out of his pants and just his boxer briefs. He steps up to the edge, the sun beating down on his back, and Thomas cheers up at him. Warren smiles and takes a few steps back before he can second-guess himself, and he's free-falling through space, bright blue rushing up to meet him, 
and he feels a flash of a memory, a sense memory of falling just before he crashes into the coldest water he had ever been in. The air is sucked from his lungs and he kicks hard to get to the surface, back to the sun and out of this water. Jesus fucking Christ! He squeals as his face breaks the surface. He can hear Thomas chortle through the icy water in his ears, and he looks over to see Thomas bobbing nearby, his bronzed wide chest glistening as he floats. Yeah, it's a natural spring. It's about 50 degrees year-round. Sorry, probably should have uh, warned you, Thomas says with a smirk. Warren splashes him. You th 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 think Warren shivers, swimming in a circle to try and warm up while he looks for a way out up the walls. Thomas drifts slowly back towards a rock that's just out of water level. He pulls himself up onto it just as Warren turns towards him to scold the man for tricking him into the freezing cold water. Warren gasps, sucking in a mouthful of acidic water as he catches sight of Thomas's ass, both ample and drawn tight by his musculature, bouncing gently as he pulls himself up onto the rocks on his stomach. Warren tries to look away quickly, but catches yet another view of Thomas, either completely unaware or way too aware of Warren's gaze. And he flips over onto his back, his large member flopping over onto his leg as he stretches in the sun with a moan. Fuck. Warren mutters to himself as he starts kicking harder in his circle, and Thomas looks over at him, one eye cracked. Sorry, I forgot myself there for a minute, I just... The outside is my happy place. I feel so free out here, away from... Well... You get it, Thomas says, leaning up and adjusting himself so that he can cover most of his groin with a hand. Warren tries to be casual, sure that he had crossed that line he'd been avoiding the moment he set eyes on Thomas's impressive haunches. He shrugs, still unsure how informed Thomas was. He hadn't told him he was gay, and in fact, his waking mind wasn't sure that either of the duo knew that he preferred men. He had no clue how familiar they actually were with him. It's okay. Can I... I just... Can I be honest? We are roomies for life, after all. Warren asks with a snarky laugh. Thomas nods, looking at him earnestly. I'm gay, Thomas, and I grew up in rural Kentucky, in a small town where the only gay person I knew growing up was the town barber, and he was run out of town when I was like nine. So I've spent most of my life being extra careful not to alienate the people around me because it scares me. I could end up dead in a ditch or strung up to a fence really quickly where I come from, so I just, I try not to make an issue of myself. Which is exactly what I just did. Sorry, God. Warren tries to explain himself, but ends up shivering quietly in the middle of the hole, looking everywhere but at Thomas's crotch, which was right at eye level. Thomas tilts his head to the side, looking up and letting the sun warm his face, thinking for a moment before responding. Well, that's certainly a lot to think about he begins, and Warren scoffs, knowing he'd said too much, and too soon. Thomas looks over at him sharply. I was going to say, that's a lot to think about as someone who has seldom left this property, and until you came along, didn't learn much about the outside world except for what was brought in by your predecessors, or what I managed to glean from overhearing a radio station. But, I think I understand what you're saying. I get it, why you haven't said anything. Thomas says. Warren presses his lips together in a tight line as he tries to process a response. Thomas pipes up again, shifting to face Warren straight on, his hand revealing more than Warren thought he was supposed to see. I don't care, though. I know my mother wouldn't either. We're, we're not a judgy family. Trust me, it's not really in our nature to worry about people's private lives, Thomas reassures his employer. I appreciate it, Thomas. I do. Do you think we might get out of this freezing cold hole, though? My balls froze off a minute ago, and I'd like a chance to fish them out, Warren says, a bit of his old before-the-manner brashness coming out. Thomas guffaws, standing awkwardly as he tries to maintain modesty for Warren's sake, who spins around in the water to give him a chance to get out. He then swims to the same spot as Thomas after a minute while Thomas scales the sheer walls. His annoyingly perfect physique is a sight to behold as he gracefully pulls himself up and over rocks, under roots, and eventually directs Warren to the path out. Warren looks down and sees the wet imprint of Thomas's body under his feet, a large wet spot between the shape of his thighs, and the shivering man shakes his head, ignoring the increasing, dreadful feeling that he was getting. Thomas was either 
way too secure in himself, in a closet himself, or one of those guys who got off on non-romantic distance admiration and desire, but flipped the switch to angry if someone got too interested. As Warren crests the edge of the opening, he watches Thomas pull his shirt back on, and Warren scrambles up clumsily, trying to get to his clothes and covered before Thomas notices him. Whether Thomas actually cared about being this close and naked around Warren, he didn't feel nearly confident enough to be this visible in the presence of an Adonis. He struggled with his shirt, the neck opening tangled over his head as he hears his phone trill from the ground near his feet. Of course, he mutters into the fabric wrapped around his face. I'll get it. Thomas attempts to be helpful, grabbing the phone just as Warren gets the shirt around his torso and has his mouth open to protest. Oh, whoa, okay. Thomas mumbles as a mirror selfie of Larry pops up on the screen, one hand holding the phone and the other hand across his shirtless hairy chest. Warren snatches the phone from Thomas. Man, I... I really gotta remember to end these types of conversations before I get to the house, Warren says with a tight chuckle, as he had the strangest sense of deja vu once again. Is that... is that how people date? Thomas asks and Warren laughs before realizing that his friend is serious. Uh, yeah, it's it's pretty normal nowadays. Thomas, have you always lived here? Warren asks, unsure if he had asked before. Thomas nods. And how old are you? Warren asks. And Thomas looks up as if he's trying to add the years up by events. 31? He answers after too long of a pause for the question asked. They walk back towards the fence and Warren's car not talking. A lot had been said in such a short amount of time, and Warren didn't want to talk anymore, and Thomas took that hint, doing his best to be jovial and silent at the same time. When they reach the car, Warren offers Thomas a ride back, and the ride is too silent as well. Thomas appears confused by the touchscreen dash and knobs and switches all over the console, and when they make it back to the house, Warren doesn't offer to help with the roof. Instead, he goes straight inside and flops down on the couch, happy to let the sounds of gunfire and war on TV drown out his own thoughts, and chase away the weird, uncomfortable feeling that Thomas was inspiring in him on this day. At dinner, he's quieter than normal, but just talkative enough that Lila doesn't question it. After dinner, he opts to head straight to his room, leaving off the TV and laying face down in the pillows. The cold from the water, the heat of the day, and the bandwidth of his conversation with Thomas was enough to tire him out, and he was happy when his eyes shut and he thought he could be in the quiet solitude of sleep. Okay, Alexa, turn the office warm white. Let's see if that helps my focusing problems. We're back. This is the uh, discussion portion of this podcast um, in which we get a little crazy and we talk about what we're thinking. But first, um, let me find this thing that I'm looking for. If you're only listening, that meant absolutely nothing. But if you're watching, you know that I just got about three times prettier when I turned that ring light up. And you also, if you're listening, didn't just see me um, swallow a burp because I eat Taco Bell probably four times a week and I always know that it's a bad idea to do it when I record and yet I always do it anyway. So this chapter, we're finally getting um, the switcheroo. I'm going to adjust the screen. If you see it on camera, my bad, but it's hard to look at. We're finally getting the switcheroo. We've got Thomas now kind of in the lead um, pursuing role because Lila wasn't getting anywhere. We know why. Now she knows why. Now Thomas knows why, but he can't let on that he knows why. In fact, neither he nor Lila are really supposed to let on that they know why until Warren says something because during the day he doesn't realize that he's told them anything. And at night they don't realize that he remembers everything that's happened to him when he's awake and when he's asleep it's very when you try and like explain it really quickly it's kind of a lot um but when you are reading something or listening to something over a long period of time i think it tends to make a little more sense um but this chapter what do i like about it i like 
that uh, you can kind of sense that Thomas is awkward and uncomfortable in this role that he's supposed to like just be thrown into and be hold for plain ladies, gentlemen, and thentlemen, that them them tolmen, that. gone i have got to move i'm tired of the planes i'm tired of the washer and dryer um and hi camera you're looking at me like i'm crazy um anyway so i like that you can kind of get the sense that thomas is still a little bit uncomfortable like even if this is something that he's supposed to be doing he's not doing it very well it's kind of like if you've been on tiktok and you've seen the like straight guys in maid costume thing that's kind of how I picture Thomas as he flirts, you know? Um, like he's flirting, but it's very kind of weird and stiff and uncomfortable and not stiff in the good way. Um, ew, girl, God, what is wrong with me? I really try and have a personality and look where it's gotten me a hunchback and chest pain and Baja blast. I mean, I'm doing my best here. Um, but Anyway, I like that part of this this chapter that you can kind of see Thomas shifting into the role that he's probably better suited for when it comes to Warren, which thus far, thus far, this far, all we really know is that he is, they're trying to seduce Warren. One of the two of them has to seduce Warren. Um, again, I haven't made it particularly hard to figure out what's going on with it, but I'm not going to say it in case you don't know what's going on and it's just not something you're familiar with. I don't want to spoil the story for you, but just do a quick Google search and you'll figure it out pretty quick. Um, but I'm not going to say it. So if you don't want to ruin the surprise and you haven't figured it out, the twist is not what you're expecting, but, um, You'll get it pretty quick. But I like that part of this story. I also like that Warren is self-aware enough to realize, one, that he keeps getting these weird senses of deja vu. I like that he, in this chapter, is kind of like, why am I acting so weird? Like, the opening scene of this story is Warren kicking some guy out of his bed, like, very nonchalantly. Um, and yet he's so uncomfortable around this guy who's like, like he said, or like the narrator said, he's done everything but bend over and grab his ankles in the span of like 10 minutes. And Warren is like uncomfortable by it. Um, I do think, and this is maybe this is a little too personal, but you know, it's December 23rd. My Christmas gift to you is me getting too personal. I get very uncomfortable on this very rare occasions that people flirt with me. And by people, I mostly mean men because women are smart enough to pick up on the fact that, you know, I'm not for them. Or people people who are not interested in me are generally smart enough to realize that, like, I'm not their cup of tea. Um, on the very rare occasion that someone flirts with me, does not happen very often, has never happened very often, um, but when it does, I get very uncomfortable. And I think I've said something like that before, and it's kind of, to me, I think it stems from us as queer people not being trained really you know we don't grow up in a in a training ground of how to flirt how to pursue this the sex or gender or ex identity that we're interested in because it's not the quote-unquote norm um and i do think that's like a huge part of it but i do think another part of it is just it makes me uncomfortable uh because like uh, like some people I know that are in monogamous relationships are very cool with, like, each other flirting with whoever, which, I mean, I guess I don't really care if my boyfriend flirts with somebody. I just don't want to cross that line. Like, it makes me uncomfortable. So I do think that that part of Warren is kind of something I just took for myself and gave to him. The idea that once you have drawn a line in your head of where you do and don't want to go with someone, when somebody pushes at that line, even like for me, if it's just a stranger I've never met before, basically all strangers are kind of on the other side of any line and I don't want them to cross it at any point, which is why I've only dated like five people in my life because it really takes it's just a supreme effort that I don't think is really worth it to get that close to me. Um, cause I'm not healthy. Um, but that's something I just kind of put in there 
that I can relate to. Um, but I like that he kind of walks it through himself where he's like, I'm not normally like this. Why all of a sudden am I like this? Like, it doesn't make any sense. Um, also, first time I've had to read something pretty explicitly sexual on camera. Hope my face didn't do weird stuff. But I do like... I do kind of like this. It's hard with... It's hard with, like, three different aspects of writing a, a series of chapters like this. Because in this story, we've covered, like, two months over six chapters, but we spent, like, three chapters, the first half, in, like, two days, and then covered basically six weeks in three, four chapters. Um, which does make it more difficult, and it makes me a little bit like, am I doing this right? Um, let's, let's hold, because... Um, Somebody's opening and shutting the door. So what I was trying to say is I've tried to kind of leave breadcrumbs that show that over the last few weeks, which we've not spent every moment with this character or these characters, that they have kind of grown and shown a little bit more of their personalities. But just like with a movie or a book or really any sort of media that tells a story you don't get to spend every waking moment with a character unless you're reading a book the size of war and peace that covers about a week so we do kind of have to skip over some stuff and just kind of fill in the blanks of yes thomas has opened up a little more and here are the examples x y and z of where he opened up when it comes to what i, I kind of want to close on with the chapter is them at the watering hole number one the watering hole is directly me ripping off this place i used to go to when i was like a teenager with family on the river it's we called it the blue hole it was literally a sinkhole filled with like fresh underground spring water and it was freezing cold and the water was like electric blue like baja blast blue and it was so cold um but thomas is just like it, when he's in the house kind of under his mother's thumb right when she is near him he's meek he's strange he's got no personality he's just kind of like master warren may i uh come into your bed but then like out at this swimming hole he's like a completely different person he just throws his clothes off he's carefree he's jumping in the water he doesn't care he's fine with it um I like the dichotomy between the two sides of him just it's kind of like each of these three characters has two sides of them there's the thomas that's himself when he is in the house and then there's the thomas when he's really himself out and about doing his thing that's why he's outside why he's always doing the outside work is because that's where he feels the most comfortable he feels more comfortable when he's away from his mother there's we haven't seen the other side of Lila, really. Um, there are two sides to her, of course. And then there's the two sides of Warren, which most easily just break down to the Warren that is asleep and the Warren that is awake. Whether the Warren that's in his dreams is truly the one that's asleep is up for debate. But, you know, there's two sides to each of them, and there's kind of a factor that... that that changes that pretty easily for warren it's whether he's awake or asleep for thomas it's whether he's near his mother or not and for lilo we figure out what that trigger is a little bit later in the story but i like that he is so clearly a different person when he doesn't feel like he's being watched or that he has something to prove or something he has to do once you get further into the story again I'm just going to come out and say it here pretty soon. Within the story, we're just going to figure out what their deal is and then break into the second half of the story, which is solving the issue that it presents. Um, once we figure out why it is that Thomas and Lila act the way that they do and why Warren is awake in his dreams and can remember everything in his dreams but not when he's awake and why it's so weird... Everything makes a lot more sense. We understand a lot more why our characters behave in the ways in which they do. But until then, it's kind of just like a series of like Thomas is more comfortable during the day when he's outside and then less comfortable at night, whereas Warren is more comfortable and conscious and in tune with what's going on when he's 
asleep at night versus when he's awake, which is when he's uncomfortable. Like they never match up. Their levels are never matched up. They're always on opposite ends of the spectrum. They all are. The duo is always on opposite ends from Thomas or from Warren and Thomas and Lila are kind of always on opposite ends of the spectrum with each other. It's a lot. It really is. But dissecting it so much is like really the only person it's useful for, I think, is me in in really mapping these characters out so that when I have to write something quickly or come up with a whole chapter in a week, I know where they're going. I know how they're going to act and how they have acted in the past. Um, but this scene in at this swimming hole is, to me, um, very uh, suggestive and sensual and sexual without really being super over the top graphic um because i could do that i could do that i've i've been waiting for this one it's been my whole life waiting to just write it i mean i've written some pretty nasty stuff but i mean just like straight up filth yeah i've been waiting for that haven't done it would like to um but this is very like the innocentness of something like a swimming hole or the innocentness of something like oh we're just going to take a quick dip we're going to cool off and then we're going to keep doing what we're going to do like com- diametrically opposed with this image of like the ideal man I mean, ideal man you know what i mean the quote unquote if you can't see me ideal man just throwing all of his clothes off and jumping into the water and floating and flaunting everything he's got but I wrote it in a way that was a little more matter of fact. And like, there's really only one, one moment where Warren kind of gives into thinking about Thomas in that way, when he's describing his butt, um, his, his haunches, his ass, which I had to Google other words for butt because butt is not a sexy word. It's a very sexy thing, not a sexy word. Um, but he only really gives into that temptation and the narrator kind of worn through the narrator gives into that once and describes the butt but otherwise he's just uncomfortable and again it may not be relatable for everyone but personally when someone flirts with me even and it's never it's never really been that overt but whenever someone flirts with me I just get so uncomfortable like I want to look away and I think that's why I wrote it like this because I can't imagine someone flirting with I can't imagine someone flirting with me, number one. Number two, more importantly, I can't imagine, like, being comfortable with someone just openly making suggestive comments that even if it's something that I would, like, be into, if it's someone I would be into, it just would make me so uncomfortable. I feel like every time someone has flirted with me and succeeded, it's just kind of been, like, a lot of joking or, like, nagging instead of outright just being like i am gonna show you my body i didn't i can't deal with that it makes me so uncomfortable um but that's what i like about this chapter it is um i think it's one of the better chapters i've written for this story i think that it covers a lot of ground i think that they have good conversation but they don't draw it out and warren is not looking to thomas for validation and thomas is not really looking to give warren validation it's kind of an ideal situation but um also just a weird one that like most people don't have in 2020 or when we would think this would be set um but warren is kind of realizing quicker than than i think i thought he would initially that thomas and lila are kind of out of place and we're going to figure out pretty quick just how out of place they are and why they're out of place now i will say I can tell what the weather is outside right now because I can hear rain falling on my window unit. So I'm going to call it, um, not for the year. We've got one more episode, I think like a New Year's Eve or New Year's Day episode. Um, but the last, the last episode before, um, the holidays, whatever holidays you do or don't celebrate, happy holidays. Um, I have got 56,000 presents to wrap and get ready to send to people or give to people. Um, and I haven't done any of it yet. And it's Wednesday night at eight o'clock and I still have to edit all this, get it uploaded and go out there and wrap presents because I do this thing on Christmas, which I, I'm, I don't know why I do it because I was raised a Jehovah's witness. So 
now as an adult, I like go all out for Christmas, even for like my parents and my sister who don't even celebrate Christmas. Um, I just love, I love the idea, not of Christmas itself. I think Christmas is stupid, but I love the idea of giving gifts to your family and thinking about, or your friends, thinking about the people in your life that you love and what they would enjoy and like really spending enough time to look at things in a store or make things. Like I made so much stuff for for people this year, like drawings and like line art, minimalist stuff, going to thrift stores, finding things that I think they would like in bad shape or like in the wrong colors or whatever and customizing them. Like I love doing that. Um, and I always go overboard. Like, um, my aunt and my cousin moved to Kentucky this year, um, from like where I'm actually from, like from California where I'm from. And they moved out here to be closer to us. And I was like, I want to get them Christmas presents, but how am I going to do that? And so then I was like, how about this year? to welcome them to Kentucky, welcome them to the South, really welcome them to the worst place that anyone could be. Let me buy them some things that are like uh, reminiscent of where they live. So I was like, candles that are smell like alcohol. That's one. That was two, actually. And then candles that smell like tobacco. That's three. Um, And then I drew them this like minimalist line art of like a tobacco plant with its flower. Um, I'm realizing Kentucky doesn't have a lot of exports. In fact, I looked up the top five exports for Kentucky. And number one is aerospace parts. For a population that believes that COVID is a hoax, our main export is space exploration technology. Gotta love it. On the plus side, um... I'm going to show you something that I did find. And if I look ugly in this camera, I'm cutting this whole clip out. So like if it just jumps to the next frame, my bad, but it's because it's this chair I'm sitting on. So look at this chair. Look at this chair. Oh God. Look at this chair that I got. Okay. It's a pretty normal chair, right? Okay. Well, it was green and the, the seat was all messed up, but here's the cool thing. It's this vintage chair and it's actually a folding chair. Okay. So you flip it, and I painted this whole thing, and then the legs fold in, and then they fold back out, and you just snap the chair back on the thing. I'm still getting kind of used to it. There we go. You kind of got to line them up. Um, But I'm getting kind of kind of into refurbishing things um and so i did a lot of refurbishing for christmas this year kind of in the vein of like picking things that people would like and then really customizing them to suit their taste so i'm gonna go wrap all those presents because i bought 120 dollars worth of gourmet coffee from a local um like a small one family owned grocery store that has really good coffee Am I dying? Hold for plane while I die. <sighs> Love being under a flight plan. Gang gang. That fan is dirty. For the listeners at home that are only listening, I just looked up at my fan and it is covered in dust. Um, but I bought like $120 worth of... Um, premium whole bean coffee from this really awesome grocery store that has like amazing coffee it's so good and so then I not only bought 10 bags of coffee but I had to buy four coffee grinders to give his gifts to go with the whole bean coffee and then I gotta wrap all I gotta wrap it all moral of the story is if you're gonna do presents and you're gonna do a bunch of presents for one person or like a couple put them all in a damn basket and just put that shrink wrap over it that's what I would do We're going to call it quits for this week. I still have to head in all this. I don't want to, but I'm going to for you. What I will say is when you're watching this, if you are watching this on YouTube, I want you to know I have recorded now six going on, I guess now seven, um, seven episodes of the video podcast and like figured out how to do it, figured out how to edit so that the screen scrolls with the text as I'm reading it at the appropriate pace and everything. Not not a one of them has even a single view. Um, The Sims videos that I made to go along with the story have gotten at least some views and likes and comments, but 
the video version of the podcast that The Sims videos go with have gotten absolutely no traction. So if you're listening to this and you want a change of pace or you're sitting at home because you're stuck in quarantine because you live in America and America sucks, um, not because we're in quarantine, but because we can't all just sit at home and not give each other coronavirus, um, <laughs> go watch the videos on YouTube, you know? Go, go take a look at what I look like in real life. If you're watching this, I'm making a really ugly face at the camera. I like that when I'm talking to like this normally, I'm looking at the microphone, but there's a camera right there that I should be looking at and I just don't look at it. And then when I make weird faces like this, I look right at the camera. So if you're just listening and you want to see what I look like or you want to read the story as I'm reading it or you want to... Um, watch someone slowly devolve into madness over about an hour, an hour and a half's time. Go on youtube.com forward slash floor rejects. I'm here. I'm waiting for you. I'm going to keep putting these videos out in hopes that someday when I die of whatever chest pain this is, somebody finds my little video diaries and I become a posthumous, rich author. But until next time, I've been your friendly neighborhood podcaster. I appreciate you listening or watching or doing both or doing neither. Please tell a friend, tell a family member, tell an enemy, tell someone hot and sexy to listen to this podcast. Um, And I'll be back next week with our final podcast episode of the year. I cannot believe 2020 has been this year. Um, But I'll be back. So will the ghost train in the background and the creaky chair. But I appreciate you listening. So um, I'm going to... Hit this little button on my camera remote, and uh, we're going to say goodbye. So, uh, bye. Ooh, I didn't like that smile. Bye.